Thank, Thank you, Brother Tony. Well, this passage I'm going to be speaking to you on, it's, it's an encouraging passage. And it's a joyous passage to go over. In this, in this verse, we turn about, about the nature of God toward those who believe. And in this verse, we see that God's not slack concerning his promise. He's long-suffering, and he's not willing that any perish. These are some good things to think about. We'll start there right there at the beginning where it says, beginning of verse 9, the Lord is not slack. Other versions say it this way. They say, the Lord does not delay. He's not slow. He's not tardy. He's not late. Now, you get some, ver you get some various uh, ideas there. Delay means you're on your way and you stop. It's like put it on pause. Slow means it's coming, but it's at a very, very slow pace. Not in any rush. It's going to happen, but it's a long ways down the road. And tardy means, well, it should have happened already. It, it, the due date was way back there, and now it's way past. It, he, he's late. He hasn't made it. He missed the point. So you see, they, they all kind of have a, an idea of truth there to them. But this word slack means bigger in meaning than one may assume. There's, this is actually a very large charge to make against God. So I'll just show you some various means, w ways that the word slack is used just to open up like what exactly people are saying when they say this. The meaning of the word slack in this sense could mean not tense, not hard drawn, not firmly extended. Like a slack rope or slack shrouds. Like if a rope needs loosened, someone says, give it slack. And it causes the person to let off the pressure or like loosen their grip. Slack can also mean weak, remiss, not holding fast, like a slack hand. If a person is, has a slack hand, very loose grip. It's the opposite of holding fast. Hold fast means you hold on to it tightly. You don't get, let it get away. But a slack hand, things easily fall out of it. Things are easily taken away from it, too. Slack can also mean backward, not using due diligence, not earnest or equal, eager. Now, in this sense, slack refers to laziness, not applying yourself to what you are doing. This you could compare to a person that's slack in service or slack in duty or business. A person that is slack in these areas does not do good work, and they accomplish very little. Now, slack, this probably gets the closest here. Slack can also mean not violent, not rapid, slow. And it is in this sense that slack refers to like delay or slowness. In this sense, slack refers to one who's not in any rush and has no aggression. Like, you know, people can accomplish things. You know, they could, they could be really quick denting things, and slack would be like they're just, you know, just taking their time. Not in any rush. Very slow progress. Slow. Slow in the sense like you're not getting anything done slow. That's, and that's, that's, the, that's the sense there. And it's when a person's slow, that's when they end up being tardy or late. So, like, what exactly is a person saying when they're saying God's slack concerning his promise? It's being like saying that God's missed the due date, so to speak. It is like calling God lazy. He's not, he's not accomplishing what he said he would do. He said he's going to do it. Well, he's not doing it. He's slack. Lazy. It's like saying God is a liar or deceiver. He said he would come. Well, he's not here, so he lied. It is like saying God's in no rush to bring to pass what he has promised, as if he has no motivation, no eagerness to fulfill it. He's not taking it seriously, in other words. It's like, like this thing about the rope. Like It's not really fixed or set in motion. It's just kind of like hanging loose, not, not going anywhere, not like on the primary objectives. Or it'd be like saying, like some people do have this attitude today, well, if God is coming, it's no time soon when there's plenty of time before, it come, before he that day finally arrives. Now, as you can see, such a claim, it's not only irrational, it's just plain offensive to speak this way about God. It's a large claim. Now, in the fourth verse of the same chapter, we learn exactly what promise is in reference here. It's the promise of his coming. This is actually mentioned here by these scoffers that come. Beginning of chapter 3, like there are scoffers that will rise up in the last days. And this is verse 4. This is actually what they say. They're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Where is he? That is, like, where's the fulfillment of his promise? Or, like, where's the inclination? Where's the signs of his coming? All these things that are to come to pass that, like, something we can look to to confirm that the universe is, in fact, ending and the Lord's coming to burn it up and take everyone to glory. Like, what, where exact, what's something you can show me to confirm that that's true? Because what we're seeing, we're seeing the same old thing every day. Nothing's changed. That's kind of what, that's what they're saying. I mean, the Lord said he's going to come as a thief in the night, and when he does, the world's going to be burned up with fire, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. That's a pretty awesome sight to imagine. Men hear about the upcoming destruction. They hear that the day of judgment's coming, but they don't believe it's going to come to pass. 
They just shrug it off. Since I can last remember, I could have heard men scoff at the Lord's coming in a manner such as this. One of the most common questions an unbeliever will ask these days concerning God is, where is he? I don't see him. Show me. Where can I look? Where's God? You know, it's, in their case, it's rhetorical. What they really mean is that he's not out there. I'm just trying to make you see it, too. But this is a foolish way of reasoning. They look around, they consider all the time has passed since that promise was made. You know, thousand, about 2,000 years. And they think that, well, if God was so sure to come, he would have come already. I mean, people say this. This isn't like just me speculating here. People come right out and say stuff like that. Well, they say, well, it's been 2,000 years since that, since that book was written. You don't actually believe that, do you? All these years have passed. Nothing's changed. You actually think that that's going to come to pass? People, people will say it. They can't make sense of why so much time has passed since the promise was made. So they include that the promise is a hoax. There's no evidence of its fulfillment. They portray God as a failure, not doing what he said he would do. Now, I do expect that from the unbelieving crowd. You know, it's not the scriptures say it best. Like, a fool has said in his heart there is no God. So we expect them to speak like fools, mm -hmm. make foolish conclusions. But unfortunately, such a line of reasoning like this can leak into the church, too. This delay, the slowness of his coming. Mm -hmm. Men have actually fallen into a state where they, can, they imagine they have a lot of time left in the world. They don't think in terms of, Lord comes tomorrow. They think like, well, I'm gonna, next month I'm going to do this, or next year I'm going to do They're thinking too far ahead. They're not... That's why I value this expression I hear among the brethren, like, if the Lord tarry, I'll do that. You see, that's, that's thinking, like, I might not even get that far. Amen. Men do not think that God will come anytime soon, so because of that, they delay repentance. Yeah. I mean, is that really, this is, what, that is really what this kind of reasoning will do to a person. You think God's slack, it's going to make you slack too. You think God's slack about his coming? Will not such of you cause one to become slack concerning repentance and holiness if they think they have all this time left before the time finally arrives? You know, and that's even foolish of itself. What's James say? Life is a vapor. Poof of smoke. Even if you do live life to the fullest, you live from the time you're born to the time you die of old age, you still don't have a lot of time. <laughs> it's still not very much. And even then, you have that presumes you even reach that far. Something you could get sick, someone you could die suddenly. I mean, this is just not the way people think today. Men have a tendency to like put things off till a later time. They've done this with God. God just puts it off, puts it off, puts it off, until it's more convenient to do that thing. Now, a passage like this, it helps crucify that kind of thinking. It really does. Amen. The Lord is not slack. That is, he's not delayed his coming at all. Amen. It is set to happen at a appointed time. And when the scripture, when that time comes, scripture say, He that shall come will come and will not tarry. Amen. With this in mind, we do as the scriptures say and watch. I do want to say a word about the coming of the Lord being appointed because I feel when people generally handle this text, they greatly misconstrue that, that thought. I do, I, often when people deal with this, like, you know, God hasn't come yet, but he's long-suffering, waiting for men to repent, willing for men, more men to come in, they look at it like God's pushing the time of his coming forward so men will have additional time to repent. Well, I'll explain why this can't be what he's saying here. It's just my own reasoning on it. Because the whole point of the following passages, like if you read past verse 9, it's provoking us to watch for the coming of the Lord. And that's going to be unexpected. The whole tone leaves the reader with the impression that they have to be living holy now. I mean, that's the whole tone of the following verses. This can't be what he's saying here. And also, because the time that is ahead of us is not the focus, but rather the time that has already passed. Earlier in this passage, we saw like scoffers making mention of the Lord not coming yet. The point of our main passage is show why he's not come up to this present point, not why he's not coming in the future. And because the beginning of the passage reads, God's not slack. I mean, that's the very way he starts the verse. Meaning that the, the coming has not been delayed in the least bit. Paul's affirming that his coming is sure to happen at the time he will it to take place, not that it's delayed or changed. The meaning, therefore, must be that God's not going to come, come before the appointed time. He's not going to cut that time short. Or cause it to happen before that set time. If God, in fact, if God is waiting for men to repent, he's waiting for men to come to his son, it has to happen between now and that appointed time, not past the appointed time. The point is that God's not going to cut the time short because he wills that none perish. That's what he's, that's what he's getting around here to. Now, God does appoint things to take place at certain times. The birth of Isaac, that was at an appointed time. The Israelites' deliverance from Egypt, that was at a point in time. God even said how many years they'd be in bondage. Yeah. The plagues, that was at a point in time. The birth of Christ took place at the, when the fullness of time was come. Amen. It's Galatians 4.4. In the Gospel of John, it is said 
often that Jesus was not killed at certain points because his time had not yet come. That was at a set time. Delivered up to, according to the determining counsel foreknowledge of God. I mean, that's it happened when God made it happen. And even in Acts 17.31, the day of judgment is set at an appointed time. God set apart a day where the, where the world will be judged in righteousness. Not only is this the coming of the Lord appointed, but it's appointed at a time that no man knows. Yes. That's in Matthew 25, 13. Watch it all times. You don't know the day or the hour when the Master comes. We made it this far in life, but we're not promised tomorrow. This is why all the saints must be ready now. Watch for this day to come to pass, giving thanks that the Lord did not cut them short of the time given to repent and be saved. Now, what men say is slackness. They say, well, God hasn't come yet. Because he's slack, because he's lazy, because he's delayed. But in reality, long-suffering, that's what the Lord says mm -hmm. concerning why he has not yet arrived. Other versions say, rather than long-suffering, they say he's restraining, patient, waiting. All these, very inver all these words, they do have an element of truth to them, but I think long-suffering is just the best way to put it, in my opinion. Now, long-suffering does involve patience, but it's not just waiting idly for no reason at all. Long-suffering, you know, if you have to give a meaning to the word, this is what you would read in a, like a dictionary. Long-suffering is bearing injuries or provocation for a long time, not being easily provoked. Patient. However, in the case of God, being long-suffering doesn't merely mean he's just being tolerant for no reason. He's just, you know, waiting, hoping things will come around. Rather, long-suffering is used to show that God's waiting or being patient in view of a certain thing's taking place or in view of a certain thing being accomplished. And when that thing's accomplished, that's when he acts. Now, there's a certain passage that really does help to grasp the meaning of this, the long-suffering of the Lord. And it's something else that Peter wrote. This is in 1 Peter. Peter wrote about how Christ ministered to the spirits in prison who were disobedient in the days of Noah. And in this verse, Paul writes, God was once long-suffering during the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. No, it doesn't mean God's being long What What does that mean when he says God's long-suffering here? That kind of like was a way I used to like kind of understand this particular passage. Is he being tolerant of the world's wickedness, hoping they would come around and repent of the wickedness before the ark was prepared? Well, that can't be the meaning. That'd be nonsense. And this, if you look at the account, God told Noah the world would be destroyed. I'm going to destroy all flesh, he said to him. And that's why he had to build the ark in the first place. The rest of the world was written off, and God did not give as much as a hint that anyone other than Noah and his family would be saved. There wasn't even a hint of that. Long-suffering in this passage would have to mean that God refrained from destroying the world till the ark was built and Noah was safe inside it. So he was patient until Noah finished his task. In this case, God waited on behalf of those he chose to save. God also used this, Paul also used this word when it says that God endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. That's in Romans chapter 9. The vessels of wrath are like the men that Peter spoke of being as brute, bit, brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. They are wicked men who only have ruin and downfall as their future. In the case of Noah, God endured the sinful and wicked human race so that he could finish the ark. This should show us that although the coming of the Lord is set and sure to happen, he will not hasten it to come to pass prior to that appointed time. Rather, he patiently waits and is long-suffering up to that appointed time. He patiently waited in the case of Noah and the wicked nation he has. You could also apply this to Pharaoh. He was mentioned in Romans 9. He was raised up for that purpose, that God might show his purpose in him, but God didn't just destroy him all the spot. Rather, he was long-suffering with Pharaoh so that the, his power could be demonstrated. And then when that, that purpose was fulfilled, that's when God crushed him in the Red Sea. After Israel's deliverance, that's when God wrote off those Egyptians there. <laughs> now, it says who he's long-suffering toward. He's long-suffering to usward. Yeah. Yeah. Us word. <laughs> now, if you quote this passage enough or hear enough people speak on it, you'll see there's a considerable amount of disagreement on what, the, what exactly is meant here. Many are not sure about what to do with that word, us word. You know, I mean, the dispute is whether the word refers to saints or to humanity in general. And, you know, I've heard it said both ways, that both views have been taken. But so I thought I'd just look around, see how this word is used in other places. And in Ephesians 1.19, that same word is used, and it's, specifically speaks to the saints. It says, us word who believe. Amen. Now, what about you word? How about that word? That's used three times in the Bible. And in all three references, it's painfully obvious it's talking about the saints. Mm -hmm. So you got one 
us word referring to the saints, three you words referring to the saints, so I can only conclude this one refers to the saints as well. Amen. I conclude this refers to the saints, the elect of God, those who have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, many of whom who are not yet converted. Now, there are a number of passages where people raise some concern about the general care for humanity that God has. And I do want to handle this with care because, and I mention these just to show I'm not like shutting that off completely, but just to affirm it's not being said here. Usually men take this to mean that God wants every single person that exists saved, not willing to any parish. Like they take that literal to everybody, every human being. And they quote 1 Timothy 2, 4, which says that God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The will in this passage, I understand, is not to be taken in the absolute sense, but rather refers to a desire. As other versions put it, some versions say he desires all men to be saved. He would save all men. And also that passage, you know, I believe it does refer to all men in general, but the point of the passage is the extent of the salvation that he has provided through his son and his preference to save rather than destroy. God has also said he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Amen. He did come out and say that. So, if we, yeah, if people want to say, like, God has a general care for all humanity, I mean, yeah, we, that's an accurate. He does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his wicked ways and live. That's what God would rather have. The passage means that God doesn't take enjoyment in their destruction. Like, you know, you think of the flood. That's not something God took enjoyment in. Destroying Amalek or these cities where every man, woman, and children were slain by the sword. This isn't something God, like, took delight in or was happy about. It was difficult. You might look at the account about the world where it says he repented to the Lord that he made man. It grieved him at his heart. Well, yeah, seeing all that iniquity, that does grieve God. Seeing his creation, something he made, go so wayward. But does it also occur that maybe the, what, part of what is so grievous is just the way he had to deal with it? I have to destroy it all. Kill them all. Grieves him at his heart. But also, it's, this passage is showing that saving men is his preference. That's, that's, that's really... But scripture has shown that although God is not happy about the wicked perishing, he still destroys them because his righteous nature will not allow such people to continue in sin. The flood, those in Sodom and Gomorrah, Amalek and his household, the city of Jericho, just to name a few, could testify that God not taking enjoyment in the destruction of the wicked did not stop him from destroying them. He didn't take enjoyment in it, but he did do it. And it is true that God does have a general care for the human race. I mean, he gave space for Jezebel. That's a false prophetess at Thyatira to repent. I gave her space to repent for her fornication, but she didn't repent. I do believe God gives all men some kind of space to repent. I mean, he commands all men everywhere to repent. That's what it says in the scripture. All men everywhere, no matter where they're at. I do not know how long that space is. But in that space, men prove themselves to be worthy of life or worthy of damnation. Matthew 23, 37, that's where you read of this. It's a pretty popular statement with Christ where he says, O Israel, thou that killest the prophets, I would gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. But she wouldn't come. So you see that offer was there, that invite, I would gather you, but they went wayward. So you can kind of see there on the day of judgment like an idea of like what's going to be said to both groups, like the sheep and the goats. One's going to be like, blessed art thou, you know, you stayed with me, like you said to the disciples. Are you going to leave also? Well, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Blessed art thou. To the other, he'll say, I would have gathered you, but you wouldn't, but you wouldn't come. Now you see, there's a care expressed to both groups, but one benefits over the other. One, one, was, one because they came, they joined into it. And I kind of like see that as like kind of like connection with 1 Timothy 2.4, he desires all men to be saved. Well, I mean, the desire was there, but because they didn't come, because all men don't have faith, all men cannot partake of that salvation that God has provided. Amen. Now, to me, the thought that God is waiting for all those who he has purposed to save to repent makes more sense to me than God just waiting for all men in general to repent. All men are not going to repent. I mean, this is made known in Scripture. Christ spoke about the end times, sheep and goats, faithful servants and unfaithful servants, wheats and tares. And to the joy of your Lord, I knew you not. <laughs> Come unto me, depart from me. I mean, this is like, you got the rich man and Lazarus. I mean, you have all kinds of God. They're firm. There are going to be people rejected in the kingdom of heaven. All men will not repent. So it seems strange to me to think that God would be waiting for such a thing to happen when he makes it clear that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And also, you've got to take into account, God's not wondering who's in and who's out. He knows from the beginning. He's known from the foundation of the world who his people were. And so, with that in mind, the purpose of God in mind, with in all the various scriptures that were listed so far, I'm, I'm concluding this is talking about God's people. 
God's people reaching a point of safety. The people mentioned in John chapter 17, verse 20, who, who uh, Jesus prayed for. Pray not just for his disciples, but those who would believe in me through their word. That's who I think is in reference here. Amen. So I'm going to proceed with the text, taking it to refer to those whom the Lord has appointed to salvation. He says that, willing that all of them come to repentance. That's not, you're not willing, you don't want any of them to perish, but all come to repentance. Just as God waited until Noah was in the ark before saying the flood, he waits till all those who he has given to his son are safe and ready for his coming. In a higher view, that is the way it is. God will not allow any of his chosen saints to be destroyed at his coming. Rather, he waits until they have repented and changed their ways. Now, if you've heard enough about repentance, you know there's a lot of strange and nutty views about what repentance is. A lot of which are just very shallow. Repentance is usually thought of just the, fe the feeling of remorse and sadness after sinning. It's usually just limited to that. I'm sorry I did that. Oh, I'm so upset because I did that. That's usually what people will think when they say, you need to repent, or I repented. They, they, even when they hear the expression, it's viewed as just sorry for sinning. But the actual word, like in its root, it means reverse. Change of mind, change of direction. I mean, that's the literal meaning of the word repent. So this is not just being apologetic for doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Repentance does involve remorse for having done something wrong. Mm -hmm. When people first believe, they see themselves for what they are. We're sinners. We, we need the Lord's grace. We need the Lord's salvation. We need Christ. We need to be accepted by the Lord, and I can't do this on my own. Or So seeing themselves as sinful, seeing they've done something to offend God, that like causes this remorse and this sadness. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't stop there, though. Right. It moves them to do something. Repentance isn't just being sorry for sinning, it's turning from sinning as well. This is why John the Baptist said, bring forth fruit meat for repentance. That is, show evidence that you are convicted and have forsaken sinful ways and practices. Show that you are sincere, that you're true, that you're real, wanting to serve the Lord and not offend him. Like if, if, someone, if someone who's committed fornication comes to John the Baptist, he better have ceased fornication if he's going to convince him that he's repentant. That goes for lying, that goes for murder, anything anything that offends God, that's your, that's your fruit me for repentance. I've ceased from that activity. I'm serious about this. I don't want to do this anymore. I know it's wrong, and I don't want to do it anymore. That's how he did. Now, what about what was the woman caught in adultery told? Go and sin no more. That's repentance. Now, how many times do you think that woman committed adultery after hearing those words? I don't have a record of her doing it. Do you? Not in my Bible. Now, her ceasing from adultery, that confirms she repented from that thing. She didn't just go back into doing it. Peter denied Christ three times. But how many times did he deny him after the Savior looked at him? He remembered what the Lord Jesus said. He ran out weeping bitterly. How many times did he deny him after that? Never again. The fact that he didn't do it again, it confirms he repented from doing that. How many churches or Christians did Paul throw in jail after being confronted by Christ and converted? Did he ever do that again? No. The fact that he never persecuted another believer confirms he repented. In fact, they said, well, the one who sought to destroy, the one who sought to destroy, you persecuted us, preaches the faith he once sought to destroy. Turn a direction. Change in direction. He's doing the exact opposite of what he was doing before. Amen. Repentance. That's what I want to get across. Repentance really is change of direction. Mm -hmm. It's going this way and turn around going the other way. Amen. It is realizing that one has offended God and turning away from the thing that offended him. This makes phrases like continual repentance just so absurd. You hear people say this, oh, we live in continual repentance. That's absurd. That means you're continually sinning. Continual repentance means continual sin. That's not how the saints are described. Right. Saints are not described that way. Oh, they sin all the time. Oh, we mess up all the time. Oh, be quiet. I don't know where you're reading that, but that's not what Jesus and the apostles preached about the saints. Amen. Amen. Like we say to some people, please raise your hand and place it over your mouth. Mm -hmm. Do not speak on this issue. The point of this main passage, as I understand it, means that God is long-suffering to all he intends to save, willing for all of them to have turned away from sin and joined themselves to his son. Mm -hmm. It's not arbitrary, like, well, I'll just, okay, I, I drew your name out of the basket. All right, so I'll just, I'll just save him when I come. Well, no, that person has to be repented. They have right. to be one of my children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to make them one of my children. Mm -hmm. He desires all to have changed from being condemned to being in right standing with him. God will not allow any of his sons to be lost to the wicked one. Before he takes them to himself to be with them forever, they must first cease from sinful activity and abandon the ways of the world. And God is patient to all his people who have done these things. 
And you see, you can apply this to the body of Christ too. Several of the body, they're growing, they're becoming great in their expressions, they're growing in their love for Christ. And he's patient in that regards too. He's letting you get these things out of your system, get these desires out of your mind, growing closer to him. And in conclusion, I want to encourage you to do the very, the first, th first give thanks to the Lord that he saved you, that he gave you that space of repentance and that he didn't cut that opportunity short. See, that's where this, like, this, comes, this comes so much power. He says, he's long-suffering to us work. You see, that's why I'm here. That's why, that's why he didn't come, you know, like 10 years ago when I wasn't a believer. You know, that's really how you got to look at this passage. Rather than, well, why hasn't he come yet? Oh, it's because he's long-suffering. It's like, oh, thank God he, God, thank God he waited for me to come into Christ. That's the way you got to look at it. He was forbearing and patient with you to repent. So I mean, be thankful. Be thankful when you read that passage. Remember, the Lord gave you that space. He was patient with you, and he saw to it that you were not overcome by the wicked one. But I also encourage you to do, as Jesus said, and watch, because as you know, the purpose of the passage is not to think you have a lot of time before the time comes. It just affirms why he hasn't come yet. That's it. <laughs> Past yet, that's not what you use this passage for. It's just up to this point. Now, what I'm saying now, that goes. To, this does apply to the future. This does apply to what's coming up ahead. The day is soon approaching, and the times we live in don't give us reason to believe otherwise. I mean, I'm looking at what's happening. It's falling apart. <laughs> Men are becoming more sinful. More, men are becoming more wayward. These kind of things are said to arise in the last times. So, I mean, you just got to look at it the way it is. That they will come quickly and unexpected without warning. And when this day comes, it will be too late to change. So now is the accepted time, as the scriptures say. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time to be casting off every weight and sin that so easily besets us. Now is the time to keep your eye on the prize. Now is your time to be living holy and blameless before the Lord, shining lights in the world. Now is the time to be walking in the Spirit. Now is the time to be resisting the devil. Now is the time to be enduring hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Now is the time to wear the armor of God. Now is the time to have your affections set on things above. Now, these are things you want to be doing right now. You don't want to do what men have, well, what men count as slackness, just delaying it. Just delaying it. Because <laughs> the Lord's not this way. Don't you be that way either. You are not promised another hour in this world. And if you're ready... If you're not ready, then it's all over for you. That's really the way it is. It's no one's going to be able to like say, "Well, look, people are going to do this and take them. Look at what all I did for you, God. I cast out these devils. I did these marvelous miracles. I don't know you. Never knew you." That's what he'll say. I do not want him to say this to me. I mean, if you really be you really believe you're one of God's elect, I trust everyone here does. We'll prove it by putting on the new man, putting off the old man. Make your call and election shirt. I mean, you want to like, well, how do I make my call and election shirt? Well, it tells you how. Put on as the elect of God. That's the kind of passages you want to read when you I think of that. Well, <laughs> and then you got to take it. You got to apply. It's like, well, well, I'm going to put it on then. You know, I was like, well, examine yourself, see if you be in the faith, and if you're not, get in it and put it on. Put on that armor. Now, although a lot of time has passed, this certainly doesn't mean there's a lot of time to come. That's really what we get from this. Uh -huh. yeah. So look for the day of the Lord's coming until it happens. <laughs> it's really like don't, some people are like, on Sunday I watch, or on the weekend I watch, and I'm not so busy. No, it's an everyday thing. Everyday thing. And it gives us good incentive why we should live that way, because the Lord is not slack. <clears throat>